It's sure good to be here today, and I'm grateful that I get to bring a message to you today. But before we do, I'd like to open in a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for your power. We thank you for your presence that's in this room today. We thank you that we walk in here filled with the Holy Spirit, and we experience it when we come together as a body. Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your passion. We thank you for your your forgiveness that you give to everyone that puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and eternal salvation with God the Father. Satan, right now I command you to be inoperable and powerless concerning this service today. You will have no control over anyone's mind today as this message comes forth. Father God, right now I'm asking you to break up the fallow ground of the hearts of the people that are in this building. If there's anyone in this building today that does not know Jesus Christ, or has strayed away from him, we're asking you today to help them make a decision to follow Jesus with all their heart from this day forward. God, you're, you're just wooing people to you in a big way all around the world. And God, we're just asking you and thanking you for using Landmark Church to be a part of that. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, we've been going through the book of First and Second Thessalonians, and uh, today we're going to do Second Thessalonians, chapter one. Okay, so <clears throat> wow, I get emotional in worship services. Me too. Sure, glad there's not a camera camera facing down here, because I've told y'all before I used to not cry. And then when I got saved, I start thinking about God's goodness, and it's like, oh, God, here we go again. I can't explain it, but it's God. So anyway, I'd like to make an announcement. On Wednesday nights, we're going to start a new recovery-type program, and it's called Celebrate Recovery. Some of y'all may have heard of it. I'd like to invite you to come. It's not just for drugs and alcohol. It's for any kind of life-controlling problems, whether it be eating or bitterness or unforgiveness or codependency. You name it, it's got a solution for your problem, okay? So it starts at 6 o'clock in the mansion, Celebrate Recovery. Cheryl and I will be doing it together. She's going to be coming every other Wednesday night, and I'm so grateful to have her coming alongside and helping us. So I'm the guy that had the addiction problem and she had the codependency problem. So we make a, we make a good dynamic duo. So. <clears throat> All right. So 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of Landmark. Amen. So that's what my paper says. In God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, and this guy is uh, Silas, is what his name is, and Timothy, Paul traveled with these men and together they contributed to this letter. Though the name Paul is listed first, both um, Silas and Timothy were his trusted companions. <clears throat> Silas was a long and experienced companion of Paul. He traveled with Paul on his second missionary journey and was imprisoned and set free with Paul in the Philippian jail, Acts 16, 19 through 27. Does anybody remember that story? Paul cast out a demon, the spirit of divination from a man. And uh, they got put in jail for that. Amen. And when they were in jail, it was, it was actually, it was a girl, I'm sorry, I said a man. A slave girl who was, uh, had the spirit of divination and Paul cast this demon out and they didn't like that because these people were making money off this girl. Amen. Anyway, they got put in jail and instead of grumbling and complaining, they began to sing and praise God and miraculously there was an earthquake and they were released from the jail. Amen. How about that for a big God? They had beaten, they'd been beaten uh, they had, you know, just been mistreated, but yet they go to jail and they start singing praises to God. Good example for us. When Paul first came to Thessalonica, Silas came with him. That's found in Acts 17. So the Thessalonians knew Silas well. He also collaborated with Paul on his first letter to the Thessalonians. Timothy was a resident of Lystra, a city in the province of Galatia. He was the son of a Greek father. 
Acts 16.1, and a Jewish mother named Eunice, 2 Timothy 1.5. And from his youth, he had been taught the scriptures by his mother and grandmother. I'll read it to you real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I uh, decided not to put all the verses on my paper thinking it would make my message shorter. <laughs> Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5 When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded is in you also. So grandmas, don't give up on them grandchildren and mamas, don't give up on your children. Amen? Amen. Timothy was a trusted companion and associate of Paul. He accompanied Paul on many of his missionary journeys. Paul sent Timothy to the Thessalonians on a previous occasion. With Silas, Timothy was also a collaborator on Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Just a little backdrop. If y'all remember back several weeks ago, Thessalonians, Thessalonica was a very corrupt sensual, worldly city, much like we see in America today. Sexual immorality was rampant. People were living any way they wanted to live. They had no regard for God. And the last thing they wanted to hear is somebody saying, repent for the kingdom of God is here and turn from your sins. And so they had a lot of persecution coming their way because of their stance for God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So our next, our next point here, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Paul brought his customary greeting to the Thessalonian Christians. Now Paul used this greeting in all of his letters, pretty much the same format, okay? Held in them in, in the grace and peace of God the Father. The Greek word for grace is charis. A favor done without expectation of return. The absolute freeness of God's loving kindness to man finding its only motive in the bounty and free-heartedness of the giver. Charis stands in direct conflict with ergos, which is works. So grace is in direct contrast with works. Your works isn't going to get you there. That was a good place for amen. These two words are exclusive. I mean, they don't, they don't go together. You can't get saved by works. You can't be good enough. A lot of people think they can. God's grace affects man's sinfulness, not only forgives the repentant sinner, but brings joy and thankfulness to him. Does anybody remember when they got saved? And you felt your sins were forgiven? Did you kind of get a little bit happy? <laughs> happy, happy, happy. Psalm 32, 1 says, Happy is the man whose sins are forgiven. Today, many people have the erroneous notion that the Old Testament is all law and the New Testament is all grace. I beg to differ. That's not true. The New Testament says in Titus 2, 11 through 13, For the grace of God that has appeared to all men that bringeth salvation, teaching us denying ungodliness and worldly passions, looking for this blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's telling us that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to everyone. And this grace teaches us to say no to the worldly things we were doing before we came to him. Amen. Amen. And then looking for the blessed hope, it says, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do you think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets? No, I did not come to abolish, but I came to fulfill. <clears throat> James 2, 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. On the flip side of this law versus grace argument in the Old Testament and New Testament, we see the grace of God when God said this about Noah. And a lot of the end time scenarios use the analogy of Noah as it was in the day of Noah. So it is in the days today we're living in. Amen. They were eating and drinking and partying and having a good old time. And then the flood came and all that was left was Noah and his family. Amen. But it says this of Noah, but Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Amen. So there's grace found in the Old Testament. 
Another example of God's grace working in the Old Testament is the faith of Abraham. Now it's interesting, both of these are found in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. It says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Did you get that? The key here is that he believed God. And you and I have to believe God for the, the atonement that he made for us through his, son, through his son Jesus in order to have forgiveness of sins. It's the same principle. And this, this verse was found in Genesis 15, 6. And it's quoted three times in the New Testament. Also in Paul's salutation, he proclaims peace over the congregation in Thessalonica. He does this in all of his letters. As I said, he understands the power. I want you to listen to this. Paul understands the power and purpose of declaring God's grace in people over the people he is entrusted with. So when he was out there saying peace and grace to you, he was declaring peace and grace over them. Amen. He was, he was declaring a blessing over the body of Christ. Peace is the Greek word irene, which means prosperity, quietness, rest, state of completeness, harmony, wholeness, soundness, well-being. It means nothing missing and nothing broken. He reminds the saints that in all things, no matter the situation, they can have peace in the storm knowing that Jesus is in control. Amen. Anybody ever been through a storm in their life? And if you're in that storm and you keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, does he not bring you peace? Amen. And then in 3 John, verse 2, it says, I wish above all things that thou may prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. God wants to give us peace and purpose, and prosper us in whatever we're doing. Amen. It is interesting that Paul says, I want you to hear this again. I've mentioned this a couple of times. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, that little phrase, he mentions it twice in this short salutation. And he's making a point of the connection between the two of them. The Greek makes it plain that the Father and Christ are one source. And he wanted to get this point across. Many of the Bible scholars believe this was the first two letters that he wrote. And he's trying to get this across to them. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are one. Amen. It is remarkable that even at this early date, the Son is placed side by side with the Father as the fount of divine grace without any need of comment. We're going to move down to verse 3. We are, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly in the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. He says he's thanking God for these people that are in Thessalonica, because your faith is growing exceedingly. I don't know. I'd like to have somebody say that about me. Your faith is really growing exceedingly. That sounds like a compliment. And then he says that the love of every one of you abounds toward each other. How do people know we're Christians? <laughs> By the love we have for one another. A loveless church is a powerless church. Amen? And we feel the love in this place. I mean, it's incredible. I hear that said all the time when they come through the door, people feel the love of God. Thank you, Landmark community, for that. <clears throat> And then I asked myself this question when I saw their faith is growing uh, tremendously. That's a big word, tremendously. They're, it's growing. I said, why is their faith growing like this? Does faith just automatically grow? No. Now, the Bible says he gives us a measure of faith. So we have a measure of faith to put into our Lord Jesus Christ. But Romans says that there's a way to increase your faith. Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as you study the Word of God, as you spend in fellowship time in God's Word and prayer, your faith increases. It's just, it works that way. Amen? Psalm 107.20 says, He sent His Word and healed them. The Word is powerful. Um, <clears throat> so here, here's where it gets a little bit tricky about making your faith stronger and more resilient. We didn't, it, so faith cannot be... It, um, let me, let me back up a little bit. Because tested faith is a growing faith. You can't really develop your faith just by reading the Bible. You have to go out and be tested. And guess what? I'm not going to go out and look for a test. So what does God do? 
Anybody else do that? They just make, now you may make a mess and there's a test in the mess you made. Okay. But I don't go out intentionally wanting to make a mess so that I can say, God, look, I'm so pious. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow today. So I'm going to make a big old mess and you can show me how powerful you are. And therefore my faith will grow. That's not how it works. God allows testing to come into our life and that way our faith can grow. We do not go out looking for problems and trials and make our faith stronger, but that is what God does to build our faith. It works that way. The things that have happened to me have happened to the furtherance of the gospel that Paul says in Philippians. And then James 1 says, Consider it pure joy. This is one of those verses I thought I should tear out of the Bible. When I first started reading the Bible, I said, This is a, is a misprint. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. I'm supposed to be joyful when everything's falling apart. How many do that naturally? <laughs> Come on, raise your hand. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Everything's falling apart, but I just love you. That's usually the last thing we do. Amen? So he says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Did you catch that? The testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance has to do its work. Amen? So with this verse in mind, we should welcome trials and testing and problems because through them we become stronger and closer to God. As the saying goes, I don't like this saying, by the way, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. How, how do you like that when you're going through something real tough and one of these, one of your lovely brothers or sisters in Christ, they come up and go, well, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> and you go, oh God, why are you saying that? A faith cannot be tested. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. The believers in Thessalonica were facing persecution daily. Therefore, their faith was becoming stronger. And Paul is thanking them for this. Paul also commends them for their growing love for each other. You and I both know that when there are problems, persecutions, and setbacks, people tend to start blaming others for their tribulations. Why do we do that? We got, uh, everything's falling apart. You want to blame everybody else. I always tell people this. This was a hard one for me to learn. If you're having problems in your job, if you're having problems uh, in your home, marriage, wherever, if you're having problems, the first place to look for a solution is in the mirror. Good place for a hallelujah. Everybody will be shouting again. <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> That's not the first place you go, but I mean, I don't. I want to go and, you know, blame it on somebody else. Yep. Yep. You and I both know, oh, I already said that. However, the brothers and sisters of this body, the Thessalonians and the landmark community, are staying close to each other much like we are doing here. Because these believers were faithful in persecution and tribulation, they were an encouragement to the other churches in that area. I, I just have this real strong feeling that we're just getting started at Landmark. I believe this church is going to help encourage other churches. I believe we're getting prepared for that. When the world falls apart, they're going to say, what do we do now? What's going on? And I believe God's going to use Landmark for that. <laughs> Verses 4 and 5. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Their spiritual progress caused Paul and his associates to boast about them to other churches of God. You know, right now they may call us troublemakers or whatever, but really we're the ones that are sticking to what we believe and we're going forward with that mandate that God gave us. Amen? <clears throat> Number five, verse five which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Paul is not saying that their suffering reflects God's judgment, rather that it will be evidence used in judgment against those who persecute them. 
God will righteously repay trouble to the wicked. I always like those kind of verses. God's going to take care of the wicked. Anybody else like that? Yeah. Amen. Seeing that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angel armies. Now, Scott mentioned this last week, and it's powerful because I had always read Revelation 11, I mean, 19, 11 through 16 wrong. <clears throat> That's the one that says, Behold, I saw a white horse, and he that sat upon him is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness does he judge and make war, and his eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And out of his mouth goes a double-edged sword that he should smite the nations and rule them with the rod of iron. I can't remember all of it, but it's a wonderful passage of Scripture. But in Revelation 19, 14, he says, The armies which are in heaven followed upon them white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's the verse that I used to think that was the church coming with Jesus until last week. Did everybody remember what was said last week? That's angels. Warring, I believe they're warring angels. And I believe they're led by Michael the archangel. Number eight. Verse eight. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at Luke 17, 28 and 29 and verses 32 and 33. Did you catch that? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. And those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, I like vengeance. I like God doing some vengeance. Paying back those people that have made so much trouble in this earth. Likewise, this is Luke chapter 16, 17. Likewise, as it is also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted... They built. Now, this is a story about Lot. That's Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen? This isn't the Noah uh, story that's used a lot in the scriptures. This is interesting. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. Thank God was serious about destroying them, and they gave, he gave them many chances. You remember the story? You find 50 righteous, 45, 40, but there was an unrighteous. And he sends fire from heaven and destroyed them all. And then I also want to challenge you with this. It says, it's this little bitty phrase. It says, remember Lot's wife in this passage. You know what happened to Lot, wife? What did God say? He said, when you leave the world, basically what this means spiritually, when you leave your life in the world, your worldliness, don't look back. It reminds me of Philippians 3. It's not in the notes. Not that we already attained or already perfected, but we press on that we may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of us. Amen? We press on. We keep moving forward. And then it says in 33 of Luke 17, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. One well, of the hardest things for human beings to do is totally surrender and be broken before the Lord. It's hard. Because our culture says the more you believe in yourself and your abilities and your desires and your dreams, the more you'll go up and conquer and be great and all that. But Jesus says the way up is the way down. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. A broken and contrite heart he will not despise. And sometimes it takes a lot more for some people to get broken than others. Yeah. Some of us have to get knocked down a whole bunch of times. Okay, Lord, I, I, I'm, you win. <laughs> I'm going to give it all to you this time, I promise. Verse 9, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. These are important verses here, so stay with me on these. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, 
when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Reminds me of the parable of the sheep and goats. Then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you curse into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then I wanted to bring out this in that day. I want to read to you what this means. So, um, you know, the pre trib believe there's two different comings of Christ. You know, there's the first when he died on the cross. Then there's a rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. And then there's another rapture. And we don't believe that. Okay, these passages were just read, make it clear that persecuted Christians will receive relief when Jesus comes publicly in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on his en enemies. Now, this is going to be one of my favorite chapters going forward because he takes care of the enemies, amen? amen? That it is the time when he will be glorified in his saints and marveled at among all who believe. Dare I say, boom. Do I, do I hear somebody say yes on that scripture? All this happens at one and the same time, which is why it is described with the same Greek words. The rapture is part of the second coming. That means we're raptured at the same time of the second coming. There's not two different events. Amen. And it's at the end of the tribulation. And I got more to say about that going forward. Or do we put it another way? There's only one future coming of the Lord, not two. That is why Revelation 1-7, oh yeah, I don't think I'm real smart about all this. I had to call Scott and talk to him a couple of times. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if everybody uh, any, heard uh, my story about uh, the end times, but so probably 22 years ago. Well, let me back up. 1997, I went to prison. And when I got there, all the Christians, all they wanted to do was study end times. That's it. They wanted to memorize Matthew 24, 25, 1 Thessalonians 4. They just, in time, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I said, guys, listen to me. I got news for you. You need to stop studying the end times. You need to start studying how to live right so you don't come back to prison. You don't need to read the Bible about the end times. Read the Bible how to live, and then you don't have to worry about the end times. So anyway... It says here, that is why Revelation 1-7, which pre-tribbers say is a reference to the second coming, not the rapture, says, listen to what it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will well on account of him. Even so, amen. And then Revelation 3-11 says, which according to pre-tribbers refers to the rapture, says, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize you. Again, there's not two separate comings of the Lord, second coming of the Lord. Does that make sense? Yes, indeed, he is coming again, but once, not twice. There is only one second coming, and at that time, all these wonderful things will take place. His glorious appearing, his catching up to be with him, his descent to earth with us, and his destruction of the wicked. What an event that will be. He'll make all things right. Here's something that I thought about, and uh, I went and got my strong concordance out and counted the number of this word. Another thing to consider is that saints are mentioned 13 times in Revelation. Now, the pre-tribbers believe the church is gone, starting in, I think it's, I might be wrong, 4 or 5, chapter 4 or 5, what is it, 4? They're gone. They believe that the the church is gone, starting at about chapter four or five. It's just gone. I think it's four. But anyway, so I got to look at how many times as saints, if the church is gone, why do they keep? Why does Apostle John keep calling them saints? He keeps calling them saints. And then I, I was listening to some teachers on this this week, and uh, this one pre tribber said, because someone asked him, how are people going to get saved? You know, uh, during the tribulation, if the Holy Spirit's gone, because they believe the restrainer that uh, Scott talked about last week, the restrainer, that's in 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, wasn't it? 4? The restrainer has been removed, and they think it's the Holy Spirit or the church. Well, how do people get saved if there's no Holy Spirit? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord but by the Spirit. 
And then Jesus, when he was talking to Nicodemus, says, you must be born again, born of the Spirit. Amen? So it doesn't make any sense. So this one guy that I was listening to, well, God's going to have like a little trickle of the Holy Spirit to get people saved. I'm, I, a, a trickle, a little bit of drip <clears throat> during that time. Does that make any sense? I, I've looked at the Holy Spirit through all the Bible and I've never seen a trickle. <clears throat> Amen. So it's mentioned 13 times in Revelation after the so-called pre-trib rapture of the church, saints is mentioned. And Paul addresses every church the same way, the saints of God. What does Paul call the people of church when he writes letters? Saints. How can there be saints in Revelation if the church is gone? Amen. Paul praised the Thessalonians for their faith and patience in the midst of persecution and tribulations. How did the apostles die? Now I'm going to get down to some good stuff right here. So here's my, here's my theory. Just If I just want to use, and I know some people don't like this word, common sense. Um, actually, there's some versions of the Bible nowadays being printed in, in Proverbs 8, and they use the word common sense for, for prudence, discretion. That's a nice word, discretion. Um, if for 1,800 years the church has been persecuted severely, why do we think we're going to be exempt? For It's been persecuted. Under the strange but wonderful impulse and leadership of John the Baptist, the eloquent man from the wilderness, and under the loving touch and miracle-working power of Christ himself, and the marvelous preaching of the twelve apostles, and their immediate successor, the Christian religion spread mightily during the first 500-year period. Amen. However, it left a terribly bloody trail behind it. Lots of persecution. Judaism and paganism bitterly contested every forward movement. John the Baptist was the first of the great leaders to give up his life by exposing the sin of Herod when he married his brother's wife. His head was taken off. Soon after him went the Savior, the founder of the Christian religion. He died on the cross, the cruel death of the cross. Sounds like persecution to me. Tribulation. Following their savior, savior in rapid succession fell many other martyred heroes. Stephen was stoned. Matthew was slain in Ethiopia. Mark was dragged through the streets until dead. Luke was hanged. Peter and Simon, Simeon were crucified. Andrew tied to a cross. G James was beheaded. Philip crucified and stoned. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Thomas pierced with lances. James the less thrown from the temple and beaten to death. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias sown to death and Paul beheaded. Any questions? What makes us think we're exempt from that? And I'm going to bring up something that um, some people may think is controversial, but I'm going to bring it up. So I'm going to tell you a story. I think this was around the early 90s. And my dad gave me two books. And one was called Slick Willie. And that's a book about Bill Clinton and how evil he was way back then. And how many people were dying around him. It's called Slick Willie. And he also gave me a little book called uh, The Trail of Blood. And it was an old book printed in 1931. And I kept it in a plastic bag because I didn't want to mess it up. Anyway, when I moved from Ardmore, Oklahoma to here, somehow I lost the two books. But I noticed it was reprinted in 2017 and I bought it. And it's called The Trail of Blood. And I'm going to read you a little bit about that real quick. Okay, The Dark Ages. Some, I Googled this and they said this is not true. So out there in media land, there's people that say this didn't happen, but it did happen. Some of you all know this. Again, I'm trying to point out how much the church has been persecuted. Why do we think starting in 1830 that all of a sudden we're not going to be persecuted? At this point of our message, I call your attention to those upon whom the hard hand of persecution fell. If 50 million died of persecution during the 1,200 years of what are called the Dark Ages, as history seems positively to teach, then they died faster than the average of 4 million every 100 years. Wow. That seems almost beyond the limit of human conception. 
As before mentioned, this iron hand dripping with martyr blood fell upon the Poly Polishians, Ordinus, Henricians, uh, these are some tough names, Petro, Brussians, uh, the Waldenists, and the Anabaptists. And it was the Anabaptists that fought back against this the most. They got, they got uh, persecuted the most and killed the most. Of course, much harder upon some than others. Let it be remembered that the Catholics do not regard the Bible as the sole rule and guide of faith and life. The claim that it is, it is indeed unerring, but that there are two other things just as much so, the writings of the fathers and the decrees of the church, Catholic church, or the declarations of the infallible pope. Hence, there could never be a satisfactory debate between Catholic and Protestant or between Catholic and Baptist, as there could ever possibly be as a basis of final agreement. The Bible alone can never settle anything so far as the Catholics are concerned. So what happened is every time the Catholic Church would introduce a new doctrine like worship of Mary, infant baptism, and things like that, the church would push back because they didn't believe that was true and then they would get killed. Amen. They had a lot of courage, the church, the Anabaptists. I wrote down some of the things. Priests want to be called father. Jesus warns us, also do not call anyone on earth your father. There is one your Father who is in heaven. Prayers to Mary, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We don't pray to Mary. Confessing our sins to a priest. God says there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Purgatory is an imaginary halfway place between heaven and hell where unforgiving sins are allegedly purged away. But God says believers go to the grave at death where they sleep until the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. And I've got many more uh, listed here like infant baptism and things like that, but I'm not going to go through all of them. But here's where I wanted to go this morning. Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonians. And I want to read to you what Paul went through. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 22 through 29. I'm never going to pray. I hope I can be like the apostle Paul. God, give me the same spirit as the Apostle Paul because he went through a lot. He says here, he goes, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. Sounds like a fun Sunday afternoon thing to do, isn't it? in death more often from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one in other words he got whipped with the cat of nine tails just like Jesus did five times could you handle that uh, that'd be tough three times I was beaten with rods once I was stoned do you know what beaten with rods is it's where they strap the guy's arms around himself real tight and then they, they lay him up and they start beating the bottom of his feet and break the bones of your feet. Once I was stoned and thought dead and then God raised him up. Three times I was shipwrecked a day and night. I had been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the cities, I think I would have gave up. That's not in there. But, I, you know, that's what I'm thinking as I read this. Amen? Think about it. In perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and in toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I'm not weak, who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation. Do you think Paul went through some trouble? Do you think Paul wrote that to give us hope and an example if we have to go through tribulation? If we have to go through all this stuff that could be coming? You know what my favorite little saying is, I pray for a miracle, but I prepare for disaster. Amen? Because it could, it could happen. 
There's a lot going on. Reminds me of a verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are eternal. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we do not fix our eyes on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is eternal. I mean temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen? So you want to talk about persecution? Paul is indeed the most persecuted of all the apostles, so are we ready? The title of this message, uh, People Get Ready. Are we ready? Are we ready for something like this to happen? Mark 13, 32 and 33 said, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Luke 12, 40 says, You must also be ready, people get ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect Him. James 1, 12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life for which God has promised to those who love him. Amen. Amen. And then we get down here to 2 Corinthians 12. So the, the, the beatings and all that I read about Paul, remember? That was 11 of 2 Corinthians. Now we're in 2 Corinthians 12. So listen to what he says here. Paul had a lot of revelations. It says, I knew a man that went to the third heaven. And so in this, he says, I, lest I should be exalted above measure for the abundance of my revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. You probably don't have a thorn in your flesh, but we use that term a lot. But <clears throat> he got this thorn in the flesh because he had such great revelations. Amen. That's the way I see it. And it was from Satan. Now, Satan does attack us. Let me keep going. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. <clears throat> let me tell you something the Lord laid on my heart one day and you may not get this because we all have limitations amen? amen and the lifestyle I live left me with some limitations I believe and he said this is what I really believe he said an ounce of my favor is better than a pound of your ability right. I'm going to say that one more time an ounce of God's favor is better than a pound of your ability. Because a lot of times we think it's our ability that get things done. But I truly try my hardest to live according to God's grace in my life when I have limitations. <clears throat> Amen. If you're in here today and you're struggling with something, just remember uh, that the power of Christ will rest upon you in your struggle. His grace is sufficient. So let's close with the prayer found at 2 Thessalonians 1, 11, and 12. Worship team, you can come up and uh, sing a song. Hallelujah. <clears throat> no pain, no gain, my brother Philip said. That's a good one for Christianity. No pain, no gain. There's a prayer at the close of 2 Thessalonians. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like everyone to stand please. <clears throat> I'd like everyone to stand and this is what I want to share with you. I'd like you to bow your head. And I don't know if it's going to go along with worship, but this is what the Lord laid on my heart. Please bow your head. So today I'd like to ask everybody in this room to search your heart. There's some people in this room that don't know Jesus as their Lord. They're searching, they're seeking, they've been asking questions. They don't know the Lord. There's some other people in this room that have some things they've been struggling with. 
And here's what I want to ask you to do, no matter what it is that's going on in your life, I would like you to step out of your chair and come down here for prayer. And let me just share a few thoughts with you about that. There's a lot of people that say, I'm not getting out of my chair and going down to the altar. Well, Jesus died on a cross, which was an altar. And he did it publicly. It'd be like having Jesus die on a cross during the Super Bowl game. The whole world saw him. He also says that if you don't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father and the holy angels. Every miracle Jesus did but one was publicly. And I can't count how many times I came down to the altar to meet with God. And finally it took place. Don't give up until the miracle happens. So I'm going to pray. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and you would like to know him today, you come out, get out of your chair, come down to the front. If you need prayer for something, do the same. We have the elders. We have Amy. We have all kind of people up here to help us pray. So I'm going to pray. Father God, right now, I pray for the people that are in this room. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit has been working on several people in this room. You know them.